You are listening to Range Minded from Independence Indoor Shooting. Before we get started, we want to make sure you check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Range Minded Podcast. There you'll find photos, videos, and uh, all the supplemental information that goes with each episode of our podcast. Speaking of, this is episode number 55, where we talk to the one and only Cody Coleman, one half of the gunsmithing department of Independence Indoor Shooting. Cody's one of those people that you meet and you realize that he knows more about a certain subject than you ever will in your entire life. In this case, it's about guns, how they function, uh, gunsmithing, armoring, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Cody is definitely way, way wise beyond his years uh, and has a wealth of knowledge for anything firearms. So we dive right into that, his history of uh, how he got into firearms as well as his gunsmithing experience and some of the stuff that uh, he gets to deal with every day that uh, some of us may not realize. As always, thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy episode 55 of Range Minded, the gunsmith known as Cody Coleman. Hello and welcome to Range Minded from Independence Indoor Shooting. My name hey. is Mark Long, and I am joined by the venerable Steve Zimmerman, the one and only. The one and only, also Thank known as goodness. Lloyd Christmas today. <laughs> I, I don't know if we told it last time, but whenever we record, I have to sign in with a name, but it doesn't have to be my own name. Just like when yeah, we're recording it can be any the audio, name you want. so I just make up a new name <laughs> yeah. every time. And yeah, I don't know so if Mark you're, you're knows. Creative like that. I don't know if Mark even knows who Lloyd Christmas is. Yeah, I sure do, Larry. Okay, good. Oh, we well, didn't pets act like you're falling off. I took care of it. Oh, jeez. I took care of it, Lloyd. Yeah, we talked about uh, Dumb and Dumber. I think on an episode or two ago. Anyway, we did. Well, I tells you what I remember. I'm dedicated. Not much. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, um, but uh, yeah, we will be joined by a special guest at some point or another, but uh, he's a little busy right now because today we are talking gunsmithing. Yes. Yes, we are. And uh, we will we will be joined by the uh, very talented Cody Coleman once he decides to come on over here, but he's busy um, gunsmithing because that kid never stops working. He has no chan- uh, no choice but to keep working. No, if you have, if you've been to the shop and you've been uh, lucky enough to be able to poke your head into the, uh, into the gunsmithing, uh, shop, you can see that there's, uh, racks and racks of guns that have to be fixed or modified or one thing or another. And, uh, Cody in and a, Jeff have to do all of them in a timely manner. Yeah. in a timely manner compared to everything else that they already have to do too. So, um, it's not an easy job. That's for sure. No. I mean, it's kind of fun tinkering with guns, but I, I don't know if I'd want to do it for a living. Sure. It's one of those things where it's like, um, if you like love doing it, imagine doing it all day, every day to support yourself and your family. (laughs) Yeah. So, and you also uh, have to be very like mechanically minded, you know? Yeah. Are you, it, yeah, absolutely. And kind of meticulous, like. Anybody can throw together an AR or even a Glock for that matter, but some of that older stuff, you really kind of got to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, you really do. Um, And if you don't know, then you have to look it up and you have to look at schematics and notice, look at how all that stuff fits together and hope that you got it right. So, And there he is, the man, the myth, the legend. Oh, no. Cody Coleman, the man, the myth, the legend, one of the uh, gunsmiths here at Independence Indoor Shooting. You just got done gunsmithing something, didn't you? Yeah, I was on a, on a project. What were you working on? Can you uh, talk about it? Uh, it's just a Remington 700 that was uh, putting a muzzle brake on, so threading, yeah. threading it all up and all that. So. Okay. Nice. Yeah, we were talking about a little bit about how uh, uh, how un, uh, un, how we don't want your job. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it is uh, it's a job. And you got to be a certain person to do it for sure. Yeah. You have to be very mechanically minded, obviously, Mm -hmm. but uh, you got to be patient too, to make sure things are done right. And I mean, I've been in there and you've been in there with calipers talking about thousands of inches. Mm -hmm. And it's it's funny for a kid that my mom said I had zero patience for anything in my life. I can somehow manage patience (laughs) for that. Well, and you, you and Jeff manage it very well, I would say. So, well, sometimes Um, let's start it. Sometimes passion creates patience. That's true. I would agree with that statement. Yeah. I, um, I was going to say we could start at the beginning. Did you get into guns first or gunsmithing first? I was into guns like at five. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> first gun I ever shot with a 22, uh, killed something with it. I was supposed to, uh, killed a rooster with a 22. 
was the first time I ever pulled the trigger. My really? dad, my dad wanted me to understand right from the get go. Guns, but there's there's serious and things and kill stuff. It's very serious, uh, but they're also for sport and for fun. And but the side is you got to know how important it is of this will do this. And uh, so I, I've always been pro gun. My family's been pro gun. So I grew up in Montana for uh, a short while. Well, actually, the first what 14 years of my life i guess it's not short but uh, <laughs> uh then i then i lived in arizona for quite a while and i, I consider myself more of an arizona than i do a montana right on uh, but uh i'm country kid i also grew up in the city as well so i've done done it all kind of thing so yeah because you grew up in um in like outside of phoenix or was it tucson i, I lived outside of phoenix phoenix that's I, right i was out of peoria so okay yeah it's like napa is to boise like two two big cities over Fun fact, did you know that Peoria, Arizona is named after Peoria, Illinois? Yeah, I doubt that. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> serious. Oh, really? Yep. I worked in Peoria in Illinois for about five years. Yeah. Um, and then I learned there was a Peoria, Arizona, and it was named after people from Peoria, Illinois. Hmm. Huh. Did, so, not, did not know that, and I lived there for almost 10 years as well. So, so basically, world, basically he's way saying is people were escaping Illinois way back then. Oh yeah, yeah, all the way back then yeah, for the last hundred <laughs> years or so. <laughs> I would agree. I'm just one of in one in one of many in a long, long line. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, okay. You've always been into guns. Family's always been into guns. What made you want to get into the gunsmithing part of it? Well, I wanted to manufacture guns first, and I still I still dabble in both both realms. But uh, uh, well, I'm I'm a 911 baby essentially. I mean, I was I was coming of age during 911, so the war on terror really kicked it off and my at the time my cousin was u.s army ranger okay and i mean probably some of the first people that he can't tell you but he was probably the first people that were actually in afghanistan hunting down the taliban so wild yeah and all i wanted to do was make sure that my cousin and the men like him could go out and do what they needed to with the best weapons humanly possible right and i wanted to be part of that system to make sure that those guys got the best equipment to go fight the war on terror and well just any war in general but sure um you know my mom was law enforcement too so i've also wanted to always make sure that law enforcement had the best and uh that's that's why i i got into that because i wanted you know i had some medical problems and that kind of denied me from a lot of service gotcha they told me no a lot (laughs) (laughs) but uh so the best way i could help you know everybody the men and women that serve was to give them the best equipment possible and that's why I wanted to make guns or fix guns or better yet, just improve current weapon systems to make them more employable for, you know, the uses that they're using them for. So that's awesome, man. Yeah. Because, yeah. uh, you know, you can only trust the gear, uh, you know, and some people trust their lives with their gear. Oh yeah. All day long, you know, and you have to be able to rely on that stuff day in and day out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, you know, it's good. There are people like you dedicated to doing that, you know? Well, as I, as I got older, I realized too, that the, the government buys the cheapest crap and <laughs> they don't give our guys the best stuff. Yeah. It's like when they say, don't, don't call my weapons military grade. They're much better than that. <laughs> They're much better than that. That's, that's true. The civilian world has a lot better weaponry. Yeah. It's funny. When I first built an AR, I was like, okay, I'm going to build it all to mil spec because that's, you know, that's what the military uses, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, after doing more research and stuff, I was like, oh my God, this is like just literally the lowest bidder. There's really nothing like. Yeah, everybody noteworthy. everybody loves Colt rifles, but I'll tell you right now. I mean, yeah, they're going to work. They're going to do what you want them to, but. Yeah, no thanks. They're, they're <laughs> ugly. There's a lot of ugliness on those weapons. Yeah. Um, so did you uh, go to, you know, a, like a gunsmithing school? Mm-hmm. That, how did you kind of get trained into that? So when I was 17, I was in high school. And of course, you told the guy, God, you talked to the guidance counselor and you're like, yeah. Um, what, they're like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to build guns. And they just look at you <laughs> like, this kid's going to shoot the school up. I don't want to. There was no help. There really? was no help in high no school, support. no support to do anything manufacturing wise. It was not, they wanted you all to be in computers. I mean, this is when I was in Arizona. Yeah. And so not even in the trades really, it was no, just, it was, everything was were, information technology mm-hmm. or computers or engineering. Really? Yeah, yeah, That's crazy. Is, yeah. I think too, this is pre, this is back in 05. So it was before the recession and all that stuff where all those high tech jobs kind of, yeah, gone, you know, sure. So they were, they were pushing for that. And I was like, no, I, I want to do this. And, well, that's so a good call, like, though. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, right. So they 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 blew you off because you know they don't care about that. They don't want 
people being in that. They don't want to support that. And uh, so I, I went out on my own and um, I started emailing gun companies like, hey, you want an apprentice or like, really? Yeah. So I started trying to get an apprenticeship and uh, I was going through like a gun magazine one day and uh, there was an ad for Patriot Ordnance Factory in it. And I noticed it said Glendale, Arizona. And at that time, I, I was so naive and so, st- I mean, I knew a lot about guns, but I didn't know a lot about lots of other guns. Like sure. there's like, there's Glock, there's HK, there's Remington, like the big companies. You don't know that there's hundreds of thousands of companies out there involved in the gun industry. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so I was like kind of blown away. I was like, oh, he's just down the street. So actually I called the number and I got uh, Chris DeSoma at the time. He answered the phone. He was like, what do you want? And I'm like, I, I just I want an apprenticeship. I want to start building guns. That's what I want to do for a living. I'm still in high school. What can I do? He's like, ah, oh, well, give me your number. I'll, I'll give it to my brother. And he's the owner, you know, Frank to someone. He'll, he'll give you a call or something. Huh. I was like, oh, okay. And, uh, man, good for you, I, man. Yeah, that's, so they, that's pretty he, cool. He gave me a call. I was actually really surprised. Wow. And he's yeah. like, awesome. I don't do apprenticeships, but I'll give you a job. <laughs> can you, can you come down to the shop tonight? And I was like, sure. Jeez. Okay. Went down, down in the evening shift and met all the guys down there and they put me to work. Really? Yeah. And so the rest is history. The rest is pretty much history at that point. But I did go to later go into uh gunsmithing school and I went to Colorado school of trades. Okay. So very cool. It's probably it's the best school you can go to. Right. And there's a couple other schools out there. I know those Smiths, they're good guys. I'm not trying to do this, <laughs> but I went to CST and CSC is the best. CST. So, <laughs> there you go. Cool, man. So little, how long was that? A little bit that, of bias the there, Smith? maybe. Oh, what were you saying, Steve? This is, there might be a little bit of bias there. Yeah, just, just a little bit. <laughs> I, there's a lot. When I went through school, it's different than it is today, though. It's, 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 it's changing with the times, finally. When I went through it, it was very... They were trapped in 1950, 1960, and really? they weren't going very far, very fast. How so? Well, they didn't They didn't have anything for CNC machining. They didn't do anything with Cerakote. I mean, also, when I went to school, Cerakote was in its infancy sure. and, and not adopted. Duracote was just barely being a thing, gun industry. And um, anything modern, they were just not about it. Really? <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, everybody needs to buy Mauser actions and chamber them in custom guns. You can make a living doing that, you know? And, uh, I, oh, I, of man. course, at that time I came from complete, you know, the industry background and I'm like going, uh, no, the way the future's, you know, <laughs> the future's here guys. Like we need to know more, you know, and it, it wasn't bad because you got to learn about a lot of the old stuff, which is important, but I've run into plenty of grads that went before me or just right after I did. And they're still catching up on the modern technology because when well, the school doesn't cover at the time, didn't cover a lot of that. Sure. Well, I'd say, what year was that? Uh, That was 2009, 2010. 2000, yeah. So then that was really right about the time, I think, where kind of a lot of that modern stuff really started taking Mm -hmm. off. I mean, there wasn't, I don't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there really wasn't that much innovation in that time as there has been in the last maybe well, five, it, it six became years. more popular because, mm-hmm. you know, in 2004, the, the 94 assault weapons, the Clinton crime bill, that all went went bye bye. Yeah. You know, George Bush, the only good thing he did really was <laughs> let that go bye bye. And um, so it took the industry a while to kind of catch up to the market and then grow a market mm-hmm. to get people into those, you know, into, into AR-15s again. And, and then all the quote unquote evil assault weapons that don't exist. And <laughs> You know, so once that kind of took off, yeah, we started seeing more and more after 2010 for sure. Um, even though it was still, I mean, when Obama got elected, I mean, we had I had more people come out of the woodwork to buy an Air 15 than I ever saw in my life. But, right. You know, it, it wasn't as 2008 was good for the for the modern sporting rifle, quote unquote, you know, the AR 15 market because a lot of people panicked, mm-hmm. bought a bunch of them. And then realized, oh, wow, I should shoot this and enjoy it. And yeah. then they got hooked. And ever since then, we've seen the, the you know, the AR-15s and the AKs and all that other stuff kind of way grow in popularity. More people own them now than they did 10 years ago, for sure. Oh, for yeah. sure, yeah. There's probably like 30 million in circulation or more. So. <sighs> Man. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was lucky to to get into guns after, you know, obviously much after that weapons ban or whatever. And I thought nothing of being able to buy, buy an AR or an AK. So I can't imagine for 10 years. Oh, it was, know, that, well, that was funny. I mean, actually, my first full rifle besides the 22 I shot was actually a pre-ban 
uh, a Bushmaster Car 15 clone. Really? Nice. Yeah, I was I was like 11 at the time, and I, I weighed like 70 pounds. So I, was, I wasn't shooting a <laughs> you 25. You still weigh six, so. 70 pounds. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, so I basically decided, you know, that I I, I loved it the moment I shot it. And yeah. I always wanted to work with those. And then, yeah, after four, I mean, they became way more popular because, well, there's more of them. Right. And I, I would I would argue that there's probably no stopping that wave now. No, Pandora's box has been open. It's not you can't put it back in. Well, and one thing that when people talk about assault weapons ban, quote unquote, you know, and banning the AR-15 and all that kind of stuff, you have to think. And, and I haven't maybe eloquated this to anybody, but you think about all the jobs that people have in in mm-hmm. the firearms industry that specifically even just have to do with AR-15s. I mean, you look around the Treasure Valley, you know, there's Odin Works and there's uh, primary weapon systems, and that's all based on the AR-15 platform. And if mm-hmm. all that stuff gets banned, I mean, a lot of businesses are going to dry oh. up and a lot of people are going to be out of jobs. Well, all, all across the United States. Yeah, yeah it, it was, it's like, like you're saying, Pandora's box has been opened. Um, it'll yeah. be a, it'll yeah, be it, quite it, a feat to try and take it away. It. I mean, you would affect probably a couple million people directly and then millions and millions indirectly from that. I mean, I've, I've been around, I mean, I've been in machine shops a lot too. And, uh, you go to a lot of just random machine shops and they'll, they'll be making F 16 parts in AR 15 bolts, or they'll be making something else for an AR 15. Cause it's such a, you know, with there being mill spec for AR 15s, anybody can download the specs and start making those parts. Right. And so many shops, do that to supplement their runtime on their cncs really and you know it's easy to find call up some of these bigger manufacturers and be like yeah i can make you this and they'll do it you know more the merrier so yeah indirectly you, you'd hit millions and millions of people yeah and really it's just not going to, if you did that it'd be ridiculous because it would just it's too much. It'd be a financial ruin for the country, I would say, or at least yeah, make I mean, a heavy dent. Yeah, it would put a heavy dent. Yeah, in. it would make yeah. a huge and impact. It would upset a lot of people, though. I think uh, at that point, you'd have people in the streets. <laughs> have some at, real least, issues. At, least, at least hope so. <laughs> um, not like violence is the bad thing, but to bring all those people out at once, it would actually show the uh, scale of what you would be harming. Yeah, and how many gun owners and how many people that support the Second Amendment are actually out yeah. there? So well, you'd be surprised. You, I, I go to rallies all the time. I'm mm-hmm. very active in that, and uh, I've been to you know the Treasure Valley is full of uh, awesome industries. Yeah, but I've not found very many of those guys at the gun rallies. Really, in Boise. Yeah, yeah that bugs me. It's a sad yeah. fact. Yeah, it's I know. A, sometimes you got to rally at like you know. A, thursday at 9 a.m but it's take two hours and run down there just make your voice heard real quick and it'd be nice to see more um at least at least in idaho i mean i should see it nationwide it'd be important but uh i'd like to see more people down there well if if a fraction if a fraction of gun owners and and uh, supporters got out it would be staggering just a fraction oh yeah i mean like if you only took 10 percent of all gun owners you'd still have probably four or five million plus people and that's a lot of people. So. Yeah. And I, I think one of the reasons for that is that maybe in Idaho that we think we're safe here and that there's no reason to rally because there's, you know, we have, you know, some better gun laws compared to other places in the country. But it's, so, you're shaking fr- your head. it's so fragile, dude. Hey, we have some of the best laws, but it, all it takes is one day that you're not paying attention yep. for them to get by yeah. and do something. Yeah. And we've talked about that a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody can do a better job of, of walking that walk, I think, too. So, yeah, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. But um, let's uh, <laughs> like let's that. so you got, um, you know, you got a, a degree then, right? Mm-hmm. Or like a certification. What What is this? I, I, I'm a certified gunsmith um, recognized. And then also I have a, what do they call it? It's an associate's degree in occupational sciences. Oh, OK. Uh, it's the same kind of uh, degree you would get if you were in the military, for example. I got you. Um, OK. It's not. uh anything special but it is a two-year degree gotcha and, um and then of course you know i'm a high school graduate and all that other fun stuff but uh <laughs> are you col- fancy huh yeah <laughs> college wasn't for me though i i did try that and oh really yeah wasn't gonna sure yeah it's it- I, I went from a trade school which is just filled <laughs> with awesome very pro-american people i might add and veterans and sure. just great people and then you go to a college environment and yeah 180 
Yeah, yeah, I bet that's a little bit different. I, I didn't. I didn't fit in. <laughs> uh, yeah, they probably didn't uh, take too kindly to your opinions. I imagine. Nope. Yeah, uh, I pretty much called it. I had a. I got it was a stupid little story, but uh, I had a. Uh, he was a history instructor, and he was trying to tell me that uh, he was telling the class about World War One and machine guns. Uh-oh. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, let's hear what he's got to say. Maybe he's going to get his history right. Oh no, he was the most liberal pinko commie I ever met in my life. But he, <laughs> he, uh, he was like saying that they were shooting out of the Vickers gun fifty caliber cartridges. I'm like, no, it's not. Hang on, man. <laughs> Real quick, I'm going to just stop you right there. That's not correct. You need to brush up on your weapons history. And yeah, we didn't get along. So okay. did you actually you raise your hand? Oh yeah, no, I, I stopped him in the middle of his deal because he's walking <laughs> around with a fake with a uh, 50 caliber inert round, uh-huh. saying, "Imagine being in the trenches and getting shot at this, but you know, five billion rounds a second or something ridiculous." <laughs> I was just like, "Dude, no, no, I'm not, I'm not rolling with that. You, you can't spread bull lies because." history is important if you overlook all this stuff you're you're making up news you're fake news that's don't do it right well and and no. you know you're right like you know understanding the actual physical characteristics of of weapons and stuff is just an important part of the history yeah because then you can you can relate more to what um you know what people were going through at that time or whatever yeah. so yeah war as hell i get that i was just like man just don't spread lies it's just not how this works and, yeah you know, i didn't get along so yeah no, i didn't i didn't go to full on college and anything like that. I actually got a major opportunity when I was going to college though. That's when um, I got uh, offered a contract to go to Kuwait and, oh, wow. and work with the United States army and through private military organizations and all that fun stuff. And uh, I really, at that point I was like, yeah, I'm not going to college anymore. <laughs> they're like, yeah. Here, they're going to pay me a fortune tax free money and go to the Middle East and help the guys that I've, all I wanted to do was help these dudes. And right. Now right. Was that was your passion. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, it was a no brainer. So I, I, I did not finish any of that college. I just said, <laughs> I'm good with that. Bye. And I don't blame you. College, honestly, so. <laughs> I don't blame you at all. I've met some extremely talented, smart individuals and they never went to college. Yep. I don't, I think college nowadays is not what it used to be. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously probably good stuff in there, but, uh, I don't know. You know, it's it's funny because I I, I went to a four year school and uh, you know it it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I feel like I got a good education and I, I I'm proud of where I went and the people mm-hmm. that I met there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it you know even when I was there, you know I I noticed that it's kind of a insulated bubble. It like, really is. And I was so that, that again. So is all the gun industry and <laughs> yeah, that's everywhere true. else. Everybody's yeah, got their own little everything's bubble. Everything's a bunch of bubbles. We're all in one big bubble with a bunch of little bubbles in it. <laughs> yeah. But I just, I noticed that it was just this one big bubble. And I remember like, you know, I was just so anxious to get out into the real world, mm-hmm. you know, and at, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, you realize that, you know, and it's, I can only imagine what it's like now, you know, and I've got some friends in academia and they're in supremely intelligent people, great folks to hang out with. Some can drink <laughs> me under the table, but, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's a different world, man. It, it, but, and, but to your point too, like you said, the gun industry is kind of in a bubble. Corporate America is kind of its own little mm, bubble, absolutely. but um, Congress is in a super bubble. Is in a bubble within a bubble. <laughs> bubble, bubble in a bubble. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so how long were you over in, uh, in Kuwait? Right, I did a one, one year contract okay. over there and uh, I would have stayed longer, but that was in 2012 and of course Obama got reelected <laughs> and uh, sequester was hitting the war on terror so hard at that point mm-hmm. it, it was throwing in the towel or pulling everything out. And, you know, I was in, I was in Kuwait during, you know, Benghazi happened, you know, and oh, wow. so the Arab spring was blowing up all over the place yeah. and we're on the ground here and <laughs> they're trying to ride down downtown. It didn't last very long. The, sure. the Kuwaiti government didn't put up with that, but um, everywhere else it was, it was becoming a problem. We're all standing here like, huh, you want to stop all this <laughs> and this is happening absolutely everywhere. I don't, I, we, no one made the connection, but the part that sucked was it was constantly after a while, you know, towards the end there, it was, Oh, well, we're going to lose the contract because you know, Obama's still in office. Sequester, sequester. We're losing our job. We're going to lose our job. And they just kept pumping that rhetoric around. It was Interesting. Just like, whatever. And at that point they, uh, they were making even more, more rules and regulations on stuff. And, you know, you had to yeah. do a checklist, you know, it was literally step by step. Like I mean, holding, hand super, holding. A super, I mean, you can make a four-year-old follow these instructions. <laughs> like, take left hand. 
place on top cover. That was the second sentence. Seriously. Yeah. Take left hand and rotate forward to lift lap, locking latch on top cover of 50 cal. Lift <laughs> up and we're up with Matt. And you had to sign off on all this stuff. And I was just like, we're all like standing around like this is don't tell us how to do our jobs. We know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and that's and, just going to make you work slower and make, you know. Yeah. And that's, that was the whole reasoning. So I, I, after one full year, I decided I wasn't going to re-up on it. I was going to stay with uh, heading back uh, to stateside. I had a good buddy, uh, Chase Definitive Arms, who said, hey, you know, if you can come back, I'll, I'll have you come out and work with me for a while. So nice. at that point, I decided uh, I'd fly back to America and go work on AKs. So. <laughs> But um, so, what were you? Uh, what kind of stuff were you working on in Kuwait? If you can talk about that. Oh, we, we, yeah, we're just working on uh, mostly crew serve weapons at that time. Okay. And then Iraqi down draw. So everything that was in Iraq, and of course we pulled out. Uh, they dumped all that stuff in Kuwait. And mm-hmm. It was a giant sorting pile of mess. It was just a Connex box is filled with unknown numbers of things that had to be sorted, and uh, a lot of them all weapons and stuff. I mean, we're finding like take out take you know, war torn pickup battlefield pickups that people were trying to sneak back and got really? caught. And so and then they just threw it in a Connex or something like that. So we we're sorting through just all sorts of weapons. And then we maintained everything on base because we, you know, Camp Eric John was full of uh MRAPs and all that fun stuff. And the mm-hmm. battalions of guys there. And uh so we worked on, you know, the Mark 19 grenade launchers, the 240 Bravos, the 240 Charlies. Yeah. Everything and anything, anything pretty 50 much. Cows, yeah. All all the big stuff that went on trucks for sure. And um we do a lot of stuff where the where the guys on base would come out and they'd check weapons and we'd sign them out for them and stand in the sun for three days, you know, waiting for somebody to sign off on something like <laughs> a quarter mile down the road and it would take them three <laughs> days to do it. So, you know, it was good stuff. You know, it was all the big big weaponry and all that fun stuff. Sure. But um which is neat to see because not every civilian gets to go play with all that stuff. Yeah, you got to play with the big boy toys. Yeah, so it was it was good. It was so good. was that stuff the concepts of of gunsmithing and how that stuff all fit together? Is it that is it a lot different or is it pretty similar? Just everything bigger and beefier. It's bigger and beefier, but this is that job was more of an armorer's job. Okay, and so I'm I always tell people I'm more of an armorer than I am a gunsmith. I am a gunsmith. Don't get me wrong. I can do everything a gunsmith can do. Certified gunsmith. I'm a certified gunsmith. <laughs> but I'm also certified in lots of armoring things. And the difference between armoring and gunsmithing is, is depending on where you're at, there's different levels of guns, uh, armoring. Mm-hmm. And certain things you can take apart and certain things you're not allowed to take apart. <laughs> and uh, being when I was working for POF and everything prior to all this stuff, it was more of an armoring job because you're assembling stuff. Sure. You're, you're checking parts, checking um your QCing uh components and all that stuff making sure everything fits and you're parts changing or assembling parts. Uh where gunsmithing is you're trying to find like why is this one thing doing this, for example, uh we're trying to make something unique or do some craftsmanship. With armoring there isn't any craftsmanship, you know, especially with the military. It's like sure. if this block doesn't pass this test, you throw it out, even though it's probably still good. Yeah. <laughs> and you grab another part off the shelf and you put it in there. And so, so it was a lot of parts changing. Uh, so it is it is gunsmithing because, you know, if uh, you're just a normal armor and you're just looking for parts, you may not, it's, it's harder for, I've always noticed, it's harder for them to find exact issues with weapons on occasion because they're not, gotcha. they're not thinking of the cycle of operations as much. They're not, they are not in tune with how the system truly is operating. Whereas gunsmiths, it's easier to do that because we learn every type of action, every type of operating system known to man. And if you once you once you learn the core group of them, you'll notice that everything's applied to that. They're all, there's nothing new that's been designed in a hundred <laughs> years for guns because it's all the same. It's just done a little bit differently or manufactured sure. slightly different. But there's nothing new. Yeah, there's like maybe little iterations. Steve, you've talked about that before, how there wasn't much new. Um, I think even in the episode before about how, you know, between um, taking, you know, hollowing out a stick and putting some gunpowder in it and some rocks up to John Browning. And then now that's been like the three big things, right? Yeah. And then just little like, you know, like Cody was saying, just little iterations or or different applications of, of the exact same thing. That's all that's changed. It's uh, you know, I guess I guess that's a testament to Browning, because he was amazing. But I don't know. Who knows? Maybe there's somebody thinking new stuff out there. 
<laughs> Cody's shaking his head here. Yeah. You don't uh, like Browning? Mr. Browning. I respect Mr. Browning. I can't stand half the things he made, though. <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> He, he he paved a lot of ways. There was, uh, you know, I think uh, the limiting factor of some of the technology of how you can machine things and how things were assembled back then, obviously because the time and era he lived in, yeah. uh, compared to nowadays. Yeah, there's if John Moses Browning would have done that with the technology we have today, it would be twelve times better. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so much better because um, there's just a lot of things about his designs that are just like really unique, stupid. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> why would you do this? Well, at the time, it was the only way he could achieve that. And yeah. now you look at it and you go, this is frustrating as hell. <laughs> and it's because it's 100 years old. <laughs> like, uh, that, so there's... Well, but nobody's, nobody's, really, but, uh, nobody's really come up with anything different with the technology. No. That's what's, what's amazing. It's true. They just applied it differently. Like, you know, Eugene Stoner and Mikhail Kalashnikov. I mean, they, they came up with some absolutely, I mean, obviously the best two weapon platforms here currently walking the earth yep. and doing, doing work. Um, but nothing that they really truly did as far as like the core ideology of how that system worked. It was, was it? already made prior to that. Yeah. It's just how they tuned it and made it themselves and made it unique in their own regard. But you know, direct impingement rifles were made, I mean, way before the M16. You oh, know, yeah. Piston rifles were before Mikhail Kalashnikov. Um, you know, and a lot of people, you know, Sturmkavir was unique in its own way, but it, it did, it, what it, what it really ultimately did was just pave the way for the I- ideology of an assault rifle, but mm-hmm. the technology that made it wasn't as special as people might you know no. everybody thinks it's like super special but it, it was the culmination of all these different actions just being assembled correctly for that purpose and then once that happened i mean it yeah, took and, off and morphing but them all nothing, morphing them all to make them work together right you know just exactly and, and coming up with how i was going to operate you know how they were going to make it and employ it and um you know, that's, but it's nothing really technically new, you know, well, that's, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's just the way they, they did it. Same thing with music. Hey, all music's been done before. Yeah. It's just played faster, slower, or upside down or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So. There's only eight notes in a scale and there's only so many different chords and, <clears throat> and all that, but it's just how you arrange it all and how that all fits together. So yeah. you just come up with a winning combination like Metallica or something. Right? Well, um, that's an interesting way to look at, at guns too, because it is, you know, you think about, you, you just kind of look at everything all together as one whole, as one whole. But when you break it down into pieces, like, you know, the box magazine or, you know, like you said, direct impingement or, um, long stroke gas pit and rotating bolts, you know, tilting barrels, and all of those recoil things, yeah. operated, gas operate, all that. Stuff. All of those things have to come together. You mm-hmm. know, nobody comes up with all of that all at once. You know, so no. yeah, it's it's nothing nothing revolutionary all in one shot. It's this little piece here and there, a little piece there. You know, like it all, and and then somebody maybe brings that all together or brings one thing to something that's already established, and then you just go from there. So, mm-hmm. um, so speaking of that, um. You know, obviously, so you came back from Kuwait and then um, you were working where again? I'm sorry. I was working with Chase down at Definitive Arms. Okay. So then how did you end up from here? What was your next step in your <laughs> in your journey from there? Oh, well, after a couple of months there, um, decided we were going to just, uh, he was going to continue on. It was, it was 2014, 2013 were really slow years for the industry. Mm-hmm. Majorly slow <laughs> for the industry. So I went back to Arizona. I was like, you know try to find some some gun work here and um after the big panic so many people went out of business i mean lots of companies went out of after business. 2012 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because they had the big the big buy up the big rushes the big panic buys a lot of people went out and over overbought credit, i mean to try to yeah overbought trying to get all this stuff so they can continue to feed a panic and they went bankrupt so many companies went bankrupt a lot of a lot of people out of had a rough time because once that initial panic was over, no one were buying. No one was buying guns, right? Because I bet you a lot of those people probably ex- overextended their finances mm-hmm. to get those guns. Yeah, and, and then they didn't have any money to buy anything else, even I if watched, they wanted I to. I watched people pay twenty two hundred dollars cash for a DPMS world. Oh my! <laughs> <I mean, laughs> uh, the- five, five, 
dollar a round and oh people were buying it because they were that scared. Do you remember when uh, Cheaper Than Dirt, and we'll call them out because <laughs> yeah. why not? They were selling, what, $100 P mags, I think? Yep. Well, that happened after. Or was that 09? How long was that? No, that was. Because uh, I remember. That was that. after Sandy Hook. Was that after? Yeah, Sandy that's yep. right. Yeah, because also twenty two long rifle was mm. just gone. Yeah, they couldn't make it fast enough to stay on the shelves. Well, also too, they 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 put all their main lines over to making nine millimeter and five five six because that's mm-hmm. what everybody wanted. So right. why why run a plant to make twenty two long rifle? And then everybody went out and bought it off the shelves and stockpiled <laughs> it and hoarded it all. And man, yeah, those were know. those were those were strange times. Yeah, there were strange times. So after a little bit in Arizona, I was like, you know, I'm a, my 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 parents moved from Arizona to Idaho when I was in Kuwait. Okay. And uh, my parents are older, so I, I I won't have as much time with them as other people my age would. So sure. I wanted to be near them, and I figured, you know what, I hear good things. My cousin's been up here for almost 20 years. So I was like, you know, let's go to Idaho. They've got a lot of gun stuff up there. Uh, the big one was Jim tech. And of course I, I knew people at Jim tech at the time. Mm-hmm. So I figured, well, maybe I'll move up there and see if I can go get a job and all that stuff. But again, got up here in the industry was slow <laughs> uh-huh. and it was even slower up here than it was in uh, Arizona at the time. And uh, it was difficult to find, find work. Sure. So, I mean, I did a lot of over the phone consulting with, some of the companies I have associated with in the past and right? stuff like that to stay in the loop within the industry. I still went to shot shows on all that stuff, but really for that part, I was just myself and a consultant being a gunsmith, you know, <laughs> just making it work, making yeah, it work, getting by you know, doing odd jobs you know, at all and whatnot. So nothing wrong with that because it was, it was good to kind of get away from it for a while. Cause this will burn you out. You think so? Mm-hmm. It will. If you're, if you're, if you do it every day and you live it every day, um, it will take a toll on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially after panics and all that stuff. It's, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a yeah. lot, it's a, it takes a lot out of you to do all that stuff. And so it's good to take a break because then, sure. then it kind of keeps you, keeps your passion alive because guns have been my passion since I was a kid. So last thing I want to do is not be passionate about my favorite thing in the world because I've burnt myself out on something. So, yeah. And that's, that's usually the, the kind of fine line you can walk with something that you're passionate about is when you make it your career, your Mm -hmm. job, you can really lose sight of why you got into it in the first place. So it's good to know that you haven't, you haven't burnt out completely or anything. I haven't burnt out completely. There's days when I I question (laughs) that I'm like, Oh God. Oh, there's always um, one day or another. It happens. But. Oh, there's always one day or another. It's it's normal. But I had a lot of buddies that you know they got home from Kuwait that I worked with, and they they opened up gun shops and they sank all that money that they had into businesses, and they have struggled ever since. Uh huh. You know, and I'm glad I didn't do that. A lot of people are like, "Oh, just start your own business." Well, well, yeah, I have the knowledge and I can do it, but it's just how well is it gonna gonna work you know it depends on the political climate and yeah. guns are very political and they're very driven by that and uh back then you know from that from pretty much till 2016 there was it was a slow four years you go to the shot shows there was nothing new mm-hmm. they, they were just trying to scrape by no one can innovate if no one's influxing money Yep. There's no money going to R and D because no. there's no money coming in at all. All they're trying to do is just make product to just get by. Mm-hmm. And that's when you saw freedom groups buying up stuff and then freedom group getting sued. And then you saw, <laughs> you know, companies going public. You saw, you know, Smith and Wesson become a publicly owned and traded company on wall street and all that stuff. So uh-huh. you saw them trying to stay afloat and you see a lot of these other conglomerates buying up the smaller groups of guys just to keep stuff afloat. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I think everybody was just bracing for the next election. So we come and we put a influx of cash and sure as shit, you know, <laughs> 2016 was a, was a good run for guns, you know? Sure. And, uh, you know, even though, you know, Hillary didn't win, thank Christ, you know, <laughs> uh, we lost more gun rights the moment after Trump got elected and we lost, we didn't lose anything in eight years of Obama. Yeah, isn't that crazy to think yeah. about? Actually, yeah. it's like something that nobody we, ever saw coming. We or, 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 or I, I, saw, I, I saw it coming. I don't, I don't trust the guy. Steve, what'd you I say? I was gonna say we gained bump stocks during Obama. Yeah, we literally gained that. We gained, uh, you know, the the what do you call those damn things? The uh, 
the binary triggers. We got that yeah. to Obama. We got pistol braces galore. Yeah, right? we sure did. Suddenly, yeah. everybody in the world wanted an AR pistol because of that. And that was probably the best thing that came out of all that was the pistol braces, in my opinion. Yeah, because, I mean, you got you could probably argue that that was like the second wave of ARs. Like it, every, it has been. Yeah, it, it really, still is. You're it right. It still is. Mm-hmm. People want an AR pistol. I, I love them. I, I, me too. <laughs> that's probably some of the best best route you can go right now. You got a bunch of 18 inch, 20 inch or 16 inch or 14, five inch guns. You build yourself some tens, you yeah, know, buddy. build some handguns, you know, so that, that definitely helps. You yeah. Know? Um, well, uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, 2016 was a, a thing that happened because mm-hmm. I mean, I remember that's when I bought, um, I bought my CZ Scorpion at that point. Cause I was like, I better do this now because yeah. you just never know what's going to happen. And I, I was smart and I, uh, I accumulated rifles that I knew that one day would probably go out for an election. Sure. And, uh, I didn't make a ton of money on them, but I made a few bucks, mm-hmm. you know, which was nice. You yeah. Know? But, um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was his own time. Steve, did yeah. you panic buy at all? Heck no. I couldn't afford to at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah it was tough, it was ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I you're talking about DPMS is going for you know fifteen hundred bucks. That, that that stuff was going on in Idaho Falls. That's where I was at that time, and it was just asinine. And mm-hmm. and I I refused to pay. You know, I knew what guns were worth, well, and, you, and I would not. You're you're part of the industry. You know what it's worth and what it's not <laughs> yeah. worth. You know. Yeah. It, yeah. Because I mean, how many people? How many people did you see, and this is either of you, how many people did you guys see who had no idea about guns, but maybe just smelled like a financial opportunity? How many people like of those, that ilk did you see come in and buy oh, I, rifles? I would say it was probably 20% of the people on this side of the state. Really? Honestly. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah, and a lot of people were either buying for a financial deal because they thought they would be banned and be worth a bunch of money. Yeah, And then a bunch of people that were legitimately concerned that they wouldn't be able to get one again. They wanted to have one. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the most asinine thing that I heard, and it's always stuck with me. It drives me, <laughs> it drives me mad. Uh, I had a guy once he bought one. He, I was like, so uh, what are you buying it for? Just shits and giggles, you know? Mm-hmm. He says, well, I, I want to buy them in case they get banned. And then I have to give it up. What? I was, wait, like, what? I was like, wait, wait, so you, if they ban this, you're going to just give it up. Yeah. Oh man! Yeah, I'm like, why? Like, <laughs> that's not how this works. Yeah, I want to ban it just so I can enjoy it until they just take it away. You know, I'm just buy it and have them take it away, and I'm like, really? Oh like, man, that, he know, miss- that just hurts to hear. He misunderstood his right. Yeah, no, it's like, dude, go fight for it. And oh no, I'll give it up the moment they say I can't have it anymore. And I'm like, then don't be buying this. Yeah, give it to somebody who cares. Yeah. He's gonna hold on to this thing and use it. You know? Yeah, and that stuff drives me nuts. The, the the Sunday, uh, what was it? Kind of, what's the term? Monday for morning it? The term out there. Armchair quarterback, Sunday morning quarterback. Or yeah, you know, like those those Sunday drivers, or whatever, you know, like that just <laughs> yeah. that are uh, they're happy go lucky, like uh, it's all good, and then I, I I don't care, I'll just give it right up, you know, I I won't, you know, they don't take it serious enough. Yeah, that's they, weird. It's weird. I, I absolutely I know, ridiculous. Always, like, well, why did you just give it up? I'll just give it up. <laughs> Man. They gave it up so, to me. So uh, we're in 20... 20- yeah, right? Give it to one of us. We'll take it. Yeah, right? Exactly. Um, or like, that's like that one guy. Remember, or no, it was... I think it was the uh, the woman who took uh, an AR-15 and saw the barrel off. Oh. Yeah. It was like, yep, this one's destroyed now. And no, actually, no, you created an SBR. It's an SBR. Yeah, the ATF is going to come visit you. No, they didn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> of course they did no, because it was on Facebook and it was virtue signaling. Yeah, right. Um, so anyway, it's 2016. Um, you're up in here in Idaho. Uh, how'd you end up here at Independence then? Oh, well, uh, it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> ultimately I, I lived up north for a while in Donnelly okay. uh, with my fiance. Cool. And uh, she decided she wanted to come back down to the valley. So we got out of the mountains and uh, she she got into mortgage. Yeah, and uh, mortgage makes good money. And at the time, I was making decent money doing uh, my side job. At the time, I was doing uh, I was managing a housekeeping department of of, <laughs> of a rental company up there. In sure. I mean, yeah. I, I, I again, like I said, I was still doing all my consolidation or whatever. With, yeah, you're uh, just making it work. Making, making it work. work. Yeah. And um, 
uh, she was like, oh, well, you can, you should get back into guns full time. And I was like, yeah, I should. No and wonder she's your fiance. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love her to death. And she, uh, she's like, I'll make a lot more money too. So you, you'll be okay with whatever you make, you know? No that's, that's, wonder you made her feel fiance. He's the smartest man I know. <laughs> yeah. She, uh, she's like, just go do that. And so, um, independence had been only open for, I think, what, nine, 10 months before I came on. Mm. No, wait. No. Months. I can't remember. I came on in 2017. No. What year is it? 2018. <laughs> so you guys were only open from June to that March. And uh, I just kept hearing, even when I was up north, a lot of people still talked about independence and they're like, oh, yeah, they, they need good people. They yeah. Need good people. I'm like, well, I can't drive 100 miles to go to work and drive right back. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, seriously. So the opportunity arrives. I just came down here and started talking with Jeff, who's just awesome. And yeah, at first, I'm sure he was just like, who's this kid? And he's knocking on the door, trying to give, me, <laughs> give him a job. And, um, yeah, I, I have a couple other people that were at the time, I guess, knocking on the door looking for gunsmith work. Uh, mm hmm. Jeff picked me and Ryan said, Hey, you, you got the job, man. I was like, all right, sweet. So cool. Uh, I found myself down here and I, I really like it here. Nice. man. Yeah. It's a great place to be. I mean, all of Idaho is a pretty great place to be, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, but yeah, independence is, is a phenomenal place. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine you probably got to compared to some other places. You got a pretty good workshop back there. Yes. And, and, and the tools yeah. that you need. Um, yeah. Let's get into that part a little bit because I mean, anytime, if you've ever been to the shop, you see Cody back there or Jeff or both of them and they're working on stuff and they've got racks and racks of guns that need to get, you know, need stuff done to it. Um, what, I mean, I know it's different every day, but like kind of what, what, do, what's your kind of bread and butter with it? I mean, is it all, you know, repairs or is it customization or are you, you know, fabricating things or is it kind of a little bit of everything? It's a little bit of everything. I mean, we do a lot of fabrication on specialized projects jeff and i always at least have one each or two each just depending on the time of year mm -hmm. that stuff we charge kind of a little a little bit more for because it's going to take a lot more well, yeah it's got to be a premium yeah. uh and these, those those are the projects that when we sit down with that customer we're like hey <laughs> it's gonna be a hot second <laughs> it's gonna be expensive because it's there's gonna be a lot of trial and error because i mean you can't get everything right the first time god i wish i could but um <laughs> Some things go great. And then also you find other stuff, especially when you're doing like one-offs and modifying something to do a one-off. Uh, the things that hold, hold, hold you up will be manufacturing defects you find in stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. you'll find out, Oh wow, this is, this is actually, I opened up this can of worms and this is not exactly <laughs> what I was expecting. So I have to work around it. You know, we, you know, not to use the term MacGyver, but you know, you, you do a lot of, you, you have to solve a problem that no one's solved yeah. before. Interesting. Yeah. So, and that's that's fun. I, I mean, I like that aspect. I know Jeff enjoys that aspect. Um, well, I think that's something that a lot of people maybe don't know about gunsmithing. Is it? I mean, it's a lot of trial and error, and it's a lot of fitment and a lot mm -hmm. of small taking small bits off or adding small yeah, things yeah, all at once. You, you can't add material once you've taken it off for the most part. So <laughs> uh, it's a lot of you. Uh, you can assemble and take something down thirty, forty times before you get it finally fitted the way you want it to get fit. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's time consuming a lot of people don't realize it's super time consuming and uh if you want to do it do it right the first time mm -hmm. and i mean there's a lot of resources out there if uh, a gunsmith ever tells you he's a master gunsmith he's full of shit. yeah he's a liar <laughs> there's no such thing as a master. there is no such thing because you can't know it all there's sure. so much to know and it's not just gunsmithing it's machining it's i mean physics it's chemistry i mean there's a lot involved in some of that and you'd have to have a mastery of absolutely everything in the universe to actually be a master gunsmith so <laughs> yeah. but uh you, you know you do a lot of research you know some people are like well why don't you just know that <laughs> maybe because i haven't done that yet and they kind of look at you funny and you're like no I'll, I'll tackle it i'm not afraid of tackling anything or making a mistake i can fix anything mm -hmm. you know even if I made the mistake or someone else made the mistake, <laughs> I can fix it. Right. And you need to be able fluid in that regard to get stuff done. And, you know, I'll do all the research in the world to do something. And so will Jeff, it's because it's important because like, don't just go willy nilly charging with something because your ego says, oh, I'm smarter than everybody in this room. <laughs> I just do that. It, that's you're asking for trouble. I mean, 
take a second, research something, look it up real quick, you know, and, and reference it, but not everything's going to be spelled out for you. Yeah, right. You know? And that's, and that's one of the things that I, that I like about you. And I think why you are such a good fit here um, is because, you know, whether hearing conversations with other people or, you know, you're working on a fun project with my uh, Walther P38 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I ask you a question and you admit when you maybe don't know something a hundred percent or you're not sure and you say, well, let's go look at the computer and let's Google it and find out. And I think that's the mark of a true professional who, you know, would rather not know and then learn about it mm -hmm. and expand his knowledge or double check or anything like that rather than like, Oh yeah, it's gotta be this. And just this blah, 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 blah. And you know what I mean? Yeah. No, you, you're, if you don't learn something every day, you're dead. Yep. You're, you're not you're, going you're, anywhere. You're, dead <laughs> you're not you're no longer thinking or breathing or doing something. You need to learn something every day. And I learned something new every day and it's important because uh, then you draw off that knowledge later. Yeah. And you don't have to go research that knowledge because you already, you've already learned it. You just brush up on it. <laughs> yeah, a reminder. <laughs> Depending on how long long it is. But that's but, why you need to be patient with your gunsmith. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's please, God. <laughs> it's what? it's not a it's not as direct as it might think. You know, maybe somebody in front of you's got something more complicated than you're and you're just in line, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's so, one thing that's always yeah, frustrated me mean, about Oh, sorry. That's one thing that's always frustrating me to, about the customers, right? They'll you'll have some people that just absolutely freak out. Why isn't this done yet? Well, if it was so easy, you could have done it yourself, but you came to see the gunsmith to get it done right. So just relax a little bit. Well, I got my, my buddy can do it in the kitchen table. Okay, then do it that way then. I'll yeah. fix it when you bring it in all messed up because you did it on the table. I fix a lot, you know, we fix a lot of things like that. I, I, it's not uncommon to get a gun in a bag. Really? Yeah. And uh, usually like a Ruger Mark II or something. I was, I was just <laughs> going to say that. But ultimately, I mean, yeah, it's it. We do we do a lot of stuff, uh, and then of course Jeff does Cerakote. Um, Jeff handles all the Cerakote projects here at IIS. He's a certified Cerakote yep. applicator, and he's excellent at what he does. And he puts so much time and effort into getting stuff done the way he wants, and he it's very particular, <laughs> and it's cool because he's really good at that. And some people don't realize, you know, you know he'll have all these Cerakote jobs. And then a couple of them would be like really complicated ones. And, and they like, take time. And they take time. And they're like, well, the other guy got his stuff back. I'm like, yeah, it was one color, man. Yeah. <laughs> You're having him do cryptic with some crazy like nine layer deal. And if Jeff doesn't like a certain layer, he'll strip that thing all the way back down and start all the way. Really? Over the layer, oh my God. Because he doesn't like that. And it's in that, again, that comes down to that craftsmanship and patience mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. I'm not going to send something out that I don't stand behind. Yeah. And we're both like that. So. Is there some, and, and, and obviously since you guys kind of work together, mm -hmm. um, do, is there some stuff that he specializes in that maybe mm -hmm. you don't do so much and stuff that you specialize in, or is it kind of all general? In quoting John, he likes those hipster CZ guns. So, <laughs> um, he, he does a lot of the CZ work in there. Okay. Um, I, we see the guy's a wizard at it. The only CZ I ever like to touch and play with and shoot is one that Jeff's touched and made <laughs> and awesome. Um, I do all the Glock stuff for the most part. Uh, uh -huh. Jeff does, is also, of course, certified with Glock work. But uh, when it comes to the frame stuff and whatnot, that's that's kind of my bread and butter. That's the thing I like the most. Mm -hmm. um, and I do a lot of the AKs. <laughs> like anybody <laughs> brings me an AK, that's that's Jeff. Just goes, that's Cody's. That's he, Cody's he, deal. He'll he'll do the AK. Um, unfortunately, I don't have all the crazy tooling that I would need to really do all the. AK oh, I wish I would like to. Sure. But, <laughs> yeah, man, it's thousands and thousands of dollars in just specialized tooling that I may only use four times, five times a year. <laughs> you know, that it doesn't it doesn't really pay for itself. So So maybe you can fix the canned sights on my Wasser ten. You don't want to do that. <laughs> the big, yeah, I can tell you why. Why? <laughs> tell me, yeah. Well, it's because when they when they pressed that barrel in the trunnion, the trunnion was machine crooked. Oh, fun. So the barrel's actually Crooked, crooked in your trunnion and uh so they can't those sites so you can at least try to get the damn thing <laughs> which, which i, true story. I, which I like, can so i can get people, it on paper but i've seen so many other gunsmiths who didn't know anything about ak's that have had customers do that and they're like man i can't get this thing to group for shit it groups <laughs> way off and i got the post way over i'm like well it's because your front sight post was leaning towards the direction that the grouping would would have gone would have gone mm -hmm. and a lot of gunsmiths are like well it shouldn't do that no it's it's Press technology, it's mass produced, and God knows who who made it. 
Yeah, um, right. And if they didn't press that trunnion, or the barrel to the trunnion correctly, or the trunnion wasn't machine right, it's off. That's why those sights are canted. See, but now, damn it, Cody. Now, now <laughs> I see. I bought a Wasser ten because I just wanted to learn about the AK platform, mm-hmm. and I figured, okay, this will be good enough, and then maybe I'll get somebody to fix the canted sights. But now I got to go buy a whole damn new nice AK mm-hmm. that'll actually shoot straight. No, I know plenty of nice AKs that don't work for shit either. So. Uh, it's it's sketchy. Yeah, they, they, that's a whole other pond. That's a whole. Other yeah, we're getting off the rails on that one. We'll have to do just, the AK episode with just Cody. Just learn to shoot what you got, man. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, I love that gun. I actually almost sold it once because I was like, oh, I, I don't. You both are probably going to skewer me for this, but I was like, I don't need this many guns. <laughs> like, I better get rid of one or two and blah blah well, blah. Well, you blah. don't and need. So I, but I went to, a lot of guns. You don't need any. No, that's true. I was like, well, I'll just take it to the range one more time and shoot it and it'll be fun. Then I'll put it on our, you know, gun broker or something like, nope, shot it. And I'm like, I can't sell this thing. I'm keeping this. This is great. Yeah, I yeah. love this. So everybody needs at least one AK. It's fun, man. And they're just, you know, and it doesn't necessarily need to be accurate, but it is, it is a fun time. So, yeah. but Hey, I learned something today. So yeah. how about that? Yeah. Go. I need to get um, another AK. <laughs> you lost the other one on the boating accident. I right? actually sold my only AK, but I made a pretty healthy profit. Really? Yeah, I made a, I made a really, well, that's good. I made a good profit on it. So that's why I sold it. Well, both the only two Kalashnikovs I have right now are a complete one of a kind. Really? Yeah. My buddy Chase Finn and Mars built them oh, just okay. for me. So wow. they're, uh, I mean, I could build an AK. I have done it in the past, but again, just like how Jeff does CZs and I do Glocks, you know. Mm-hmm. I could build an AK, I could build a good AK, but my buddy built the best AK. <laughs> so those are the ones I trust in my hands are sure. the best made ones. So, um, you know, when it, when it comes to that. So yeah, you you come in come into our shop here in Independence and, you know, there'll be a few projects that I definitely would say, well, Jeff's going to handle this because I'm mm-hmm. not going to touch it because yeah. that's Jeff's expertise or the area he has either a the most fun or that's something he's extremely cozy with and that's what he wants to do yeah. I mean, i love working on glocks i'm super comfortable with those i right. don't worry about making mistakes because i've made all the mistakes i've already earned all that <laughs> i got that t-shirt and all that stuff so it's the stuff i like um of course ar-15s you know jeff's probably made as many as i have maybe i don't know I, i've <laughs> probably made about forty thousand. AR-15s or something at this point. So you can do it blindfolded upside down, half asleep, basically. I thought about doing the bird box challenge with, <laughs> with like an arrow lower just for shits and giggles. That'd be I, fun. I bet you I could do that. No yeah. problem. Probably in a pretty quick amount of time. That'd so. be kind of fun. That'd be a good video. Yeah, it would be, actually. Yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so uh, actually speaking of like doing all this stuff, um, what do you think um, or what do you see maybe more of people try to do something themselves and maybe they shouldn't have? Where do you maybe draw that line of say, OK, you might be able to like you can maybe build an AR at home, mm-hmm. you know, or, or take an AR build class like we have here. But like where, you know, or maybe install your own sites if you're if you have the right tools or stuff. But where's kind of the line that you maybe would draw to say, yeah, you should probably bring that in. Or is it, a ca- <laughs> is it maybe a case by case basis? Probably more case by case basis because I met some really competent individuals in this world that could probably handle what I do mm-hmm. and not be a gunsman. But then again, uh don't play with headspace on anything <laughs> if you think uh, you know better and don't need a gunsmith. Um, when you when you have like AR-15s and stuff that have a loose you know barrel extension on or something, you need to a probably just send that barrel back to the manufacturer and be like, <laughs> hey, you built you sent me a out of space a headspace gun. But you know we're talking when you get into headspace issues, uh, you got you know. 60,000 PSI in front of your face, you know, (laughs) it's going to go somewhere, you know, it's going to hurt you a lot. Yeah. Um, Well, and you've seen your fair share of blown up guns even here, right? Yes. I've seen lots of guns. The other thing is, is reloading. Good God, don't make your own (laughs) defensive loads because you think that the judge isn't going to get mad at you for shooting somebody with a homemade bullet. Don't, don't do that. (laughs) Because, you know, you run into people that are like trying to like plus people plus like 147 grain bullets and you're like in a nine millimeter you're like you can't can't do that that's why also your sigs in my shop in a thousand pieces yeah. <laughs> like don't 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 do things like that if you're not comfortable with reloading i highly suggest do not do not do it yourself yeah don't do your own defensive loads yeah don't do your own defensive loads and if you're not competent in weights and measures and you're not well, paying attention i wouldn't play with i would it. never reload defensive loads anyways it's like yeah, ever, but you'd be surprised how many people 
bring them in here and oh, yeah. you're trying to do something stupid. Um, don't play with, you know, so yeah, don't, don't mess with head spacing or new rifle or anything. Have somebody with gauges or at least knows what they're doing here. Like a gunsmith that can do all the other techniques besides using just head space gauges to actually measure and and confirm that Mm -hmm. everything's where it's supposed to be. But then again, also, like I said, with AR 15s, just a good note for everybody to know, they should be head spaced from the factory. If you bought it from a quality manufacturer, (laughs) you don't need to come see me every time and ask me, is it in head space? Well, who made your barrel? Okay. A good company. Fine. It's been head spaced. (laughs) It's been pinned there at the factory. I don't set head space on AR 15s. Yeah. But can you, uh, and sorry to interrupt, but can you uh, just explain what head space is real quick? Uh, head space is, it's complicated <laughs> to explain, but it's the, the magical number of how deep your round is sitting in your chamber mm-hmm. and how much play you can have with your bolt face and lock up. So if you have too great of a head space, you have too much open area for mm-hmm. your cartridge. It'll be too sloppy. And gases can get around it. And they go the wrong direction and explode and explode. <laughs> so that's like a way too loose head space, for example. And a too tight a head space is you're trying to mush and crush the round into the chamber, for example. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, you deform the case and you allow that case to start maybe getting weak in the wall or up on the neck and it blows out there as well as that. And then, of course, nothing's in complete lockup and the whole thing shears gives, gives way because it's too much pressure. Right. So, um, it's that magical distance of how deep that all sits in there properly the, the, from the bolt head and the chamber face. Um, there's magical numbers out there for that. There's these cool formulas that, you know, if you know what you're looking for. You can, <laughs> you can apply and get the exact number and it will tell you your plus or minus of what your head space should be. Sure. So it's, um, it's important to, you know, not play with that if you could avoid it. And that's something actually probably that a lot of people don't think about either is that you have to know probably just as much about ballistics and mm-hmm. about cartridges and ammunition and all that as you do the firearm, mm-hmm. because that's a key integral part of it. I mean, without one, you don't really have the other. Yeah, exactly. So do they teach a lot of that ballistics uh, and, and whatnot in, in gunsmithing school, or is that something you kind of have to learn as you go? You'll learn a lot more as, as you go, mm-hmm. but, but you'll get the basics at school Mm -hmm. just enough to keep you out of trouble um or at least to dabble or or put you in trouble jeff yeah if you want to know anything about reloading talk to jeff (laughs) see there you go don't don't ask me too much about it because i i've i've always shot too much to care about sitting down (laughs) but you know it's there's some important things to be learned there and discuss it with an expert before you go out and try it yourself yeah Um, and if you have somebody that's done it before and actually knows what they're doing maybe sit down and watch them do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Reloading is a whole nother ball game too, yeah. man. That's, I mean, that's, and the people who do it have some dedication and, yeah. and who are good at it rather. Mm-hmm. They, you know, cause I've seen people who reload and then they, they go out and they have a notebook and they take, you know, detailed notes about everything. Those and, guys are crazy. Yeah. They're usually retired too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they got all the time in the world to do that. So, um, so, you know, it's funny cause you, you've done a little bit of everything seems like, and you do a little bit of everything every day. What's, um, um, either your favorite project to do or what's um, the, the project that you've done in your career so far that you're most proud of? Hmm. That's a lot. <laughs> um, I, I was really proud of what I did um, with the army and over in Kuwait. I really, <laughs> really enjoyed that. Uh, trade that for the world. Um, stuff that I, I, I've been into heavily and will continue to go even more into detail we'll be uh working with the glock platform Mm -hmm. and doing all the fun stuff that you see people are doing to them now um you can make a glock not feel like a glock in a hurry if you know what you're doing Mm -hmm. you can also ruin a glock very fast if you do that (laughs) oh yeah but uh there's a lot of cool things out there and more and more people are playing with them and uh it's not uncharted waters, but it's waters that are being further explore, uh, explored and exploited when yeah. it comes down to, to Glocks. And uh, the, the customization of that has been somewhere I've put a lot of my time and effort into lately. And uh, I enjoy every minute of it. So that's something that I'm very happy to be doing and want to continue to do even more because there's just all these neat little things coming out. and Yeah. Um, I've just been enjoying that a lot because I've been mainly building rifles for the last 10 years, you know? So it's, it's kind of nice to dabble in handguns, 
to the extent that I've been able to do, especially in the last year. Yeah. So, um, pistol smithing, I guess. Well, know. and I feel, I feel like a lot of, there's been a lot of innovation in pistols in the last couple mm. of years and a lot of changes, you know, people are, you know, what a year, a year and a half ago, a red dot on a pistol was like, Oh my God, what the <laughs> hell? Yes. And now it's like, person's coming in with you know an rmr or some kind of a red dot on their pistol now yeah you know the, the technology is kind of being applied from rifles to pistols you're seeing comped handguns that are you know threaded is really neat comps either they work yeah. really well or they don't work at all i mean it just depends on which one who you're going with you know there's just a lot of uh new ways of manipulating and shooting handguns and you know i've spent a lot of time doing all that stuff with rifles i mean i've been through some fantastic rifle classes with like Travis Haley and people like that. Wow. And now you're seeing more and more people put more effort into their everyday carry pistols and then they're taking them off into these really cool areas of like, Oh, why would you do that? Okay. That makes sense. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, they're putting as much more, they're just trying to add that ability to the handgun as much as possible. And it's, and, and it's uh, just killing 1911 guys. It's just killing them. <laughs> it's killing them. Yeah. Uh, no longer. 1911's dead. It's been dead for a long damn time, and I'm not a 1911 <laughs> fan. Uh, <laughs> some of you guys might know that, but uh, I'll work on them. But uh, no, a gun you know that what? Though that much fitting is another thing I like about Cody though is that he says he will give you his opinion, but he doesn't say you should do this. Yeah. You know, you've got your opinions, and I think you've got it backed up. You've got you know knowledge and experience backed up, but. Um, you know, you're never like, oh, you should do this. You should do that. It's like, it's what works for me. It's what my opinion is. But, you know. Um, yeah, no, no, the Glock won't fit in everybody's hand. I mean, ask Jeff <laughs> doesn't fit in his hand. He don't like that because he doesn't fit in his hands. So. Right, right. And that, that's kind of why I'm not a big Glock. I don't mind Glocks or whatever. But, I mean, if I ever buy a Glock, I'm just going to bring it to you and be like, here, take six months. Do whatever you want to and make it cool. Yeah. <laughs> make it feel like a culture, um, huh? Yeah, please yeah for a lefty um no that kind of goes hand in hand with what we were talking about uh, a bit earlier um is that when you make you know handguns and, and firearms just in general perform better um and are smoother and are more accessible to the general public i think that's one of the secrets to to making sure that we you know are that our gun rights are protected mm-hmm. um and but by and we talked about it on the podcast before uh ad nauseum basically just getting more people involved in the mm-hmm. sport of shooting um how do you so let's go back to like the activism that you talked about um a little bit um you know you want to talk about how you're kind of involved in that going to rallies and, and stuff like that mm-hmm. sure um I, I think it's important i write my congressman every month at least twice a month really i do I you're do. a great I write, american I, I write my reps too i have one rep um well, I, I've recently moved from Boise to Napa, mm-hmm. but of course I had a, you know, living in Boise, we had, uh, the district I was in, for, for <laughs> example, uh, we're all Democrats. Right. And they didn't like me writing them letters. But, really? Um, needless to say, I still wrote them regardless. Sure. You know, like you, you know, that person came from California and they got elected but, and they, they, they aren't changing their mind, but I'm still going to be like, Hey, you know this is still my opinion. You still technically represent me in this area. They work for us. They yeah, for they us. do. So, you know, I wrote the governor a lot. I wrote the governor recently. I was like, Hey, you know, cause <laughs> we, we sat down when Brad Little was here uh, at independence uh-huh. last year, he did his campaign rally. He's like, I'm going to want to be good with gun rights and I'm going to make sure we expand all this good stuff. And I wrote him a letter and I was just like, Hey bro, <laughs> Remember that conversation we had a year ago that you were going <laughs> to sign off on stuff? You need to sign off on this bill. Mm-hmm. You don't, I will not, I will go out of my way and I will make sure you don't get reelected because I will <laughs> go out and I'll tell everybody that you came in, you used some facilities, preached a big, big game, and then didn't do anything. Yeah, you know, right. like, you can't do that. I think, you know, Tony Montana had it right. All you have in this world is your word and your balls. <laughs> that's it i mean if you really break it down to the basic thing tony montana is 100 percent right sure from scarface and yeah you don't obviously don't go around scarface but it's true you, you know so if you're gonna say you're gonna do something you should do it yeah. sure um and then yeah so you were you talked about going to to some rallies and stuff at the mm-hmm. capitol yeah I, i'm a big supporter of the idaho second amendment alliance sure and everybody who's an idaho needs to be a member of that organization greg pruitt is running that and that guy is awesome he is literally in the capitol building like every day yes, he is pounding on the door and uh i mean we like for example with the uh the marcy law last month 
they uh we did a quick rally and we showed up and just us showing up killed that bill really we had about 150 people on a thursday morning at like 8 a.m mm -hmm. which is incredible that that many people showed up but uh him just walking into the congress uh, into into the the chamber there they they said we're gonna throw it out <laughs> like if you're standing in the hall we're not gonna even do this so they wow they, they they killed that version of it. I guess they have another version of it again, and it still has some bad language. Big flaws. It's not good for gun owners. And uh, so, of course, we'll be back. <laughs> you know? So make sure if you have the opportunity, you should join that organization because the other thing I'm really a big fan of with Idaho Second Amendment Alliance is they work very closely with gun owners of America. Mm -hmm. And if you're a true pro-Second pro Amendment person, you should be with the GOA. Yeah and not anywhere remotely close to the NRA. <laughs> of course, we need a united front, quote unquote, everybody wants to say, but you know what? The GOA is not actively going behind your back, screwing you yeah. like the NRA is. Yeah, we've the talked NRA, about it. I've had, I've, I've had communication with the NRA on some stuff and, you know, I'm still a member because I have to keep some certificates going, unfortunately. But uh, um, the, the problem is, is they have, they have the voice in the lobby right now. And I believe it's, but I believe not. it's been subverted to an extent and that needs to, they, they need to clean house with, with who they have. I don't think the organization is yeah. completely garbage, but they just need to fix some of the people in the top. And, and unfortunately there's just too much money there. I think the NRA has become just as much of the swamp personally. Sure. As, as Washington, they're all just part of this big shell game. Well, and we've talked about how I think we've talked about the GOA, you know, doing a lot of good work. And we've talked about Firearms Policy Coalition doing a lot of good work. Excellent. And I think that's really where, um, you know, the the future of gun politics really is, is, is you have an, or, an organization that just focuses on on one, you know, on the Second Amendment, right. on, okay. on gun owning. Zero what, compromise. Right. And, there, and there's no necessarily political affiliation because, you know, and we've talked about this before, there are people who are conservative who are gun owners. There's Democratic mm -hmm. gun owners. There's, there's a, you know. There's a lot more people that support the Second Amendment than just the right. That's oh, for I'm, sure. I'm 100%. Gonna, there's a lot of other groups out there. And I, I, I'm glad that, like, you know, I don't think the NRA has that image to pull in all those groups as easily as some other groups do. GOA, of course, sounds a little bit more radical because, I mean, they literally walk in and nobody wants to negotiate with, <laughs> with you know, great um, Got, uh, Eric Pratt and all yeah. those guys because they will just put their foot down. No, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of, you know, anti-gun politicians that just absolutely can't stand the GOA because they there is no negotiating. <laughs> but, I mean, sometimes that's, that's almost too hard of a, an angle, I agree. Sure. For, to get all the, you know, the, the smaller groups of people that are pro-gun, but necessarily they're not right, right wing or mm -hmm. like that. And the GOA is not really right wing. They're just really, really pro-Second Amendment, which from years and years of brainwashing society, being super pro-gun must make you super righty yeah. you know, somehow. And that's that's been propagandized forever. And yeah. That's not true. I'm a libertarian, so <laughs> I, I, I'm not left or right, but uh, I definitely side with the idea of, you know, touch the second minute period. And that's that's ours. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I was explaining it to somebody the other day about how, you know, the Second Amendment isn't necessarily about, you know, the right to defend yourself or anything like that. That's a human right. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, you know, like a, a right given to you from your creator and all that. And what the Second Amendment just guarantees is that that right won't be infringed. That right is already given to you mm -hmm. as a human right, you know. Yeah. But all gun laws are infringement <laughs> and they are all infringing on that Second Amendment right in one way or another. So. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, repeal the NFA, repeal the Hughes Amendment, you know, That'd all that great. stuff. That'd be great. I mean, <laughs> I know there, and the thing is, the GOA is actively working on that right now, mm -hmm. trying to at least get NFA thrown out of the court because you can't tax a right. Right. And the NFA literally yeah. taxes that right, which is, it, it's such a gross violation. It's just, you know, it goes to show you how dumb they, they were able to just convince people at the time too, back in the thirties when they passed that, they didn't have Facebook. You think that they would have told the nation outright that we're going to tax guns because we think they're dangerous and we're going to tax your rights so you can't own certain things? This two hundred dollars was like a house payment, you know, like yeah, half your right. house back yeah. then. It was yeah. a lot of money, and, but there was no, no doing this, so there was no protest from anybody saying, "Hey, don't do this," you know, yeah. like 
And here, here you go. Well, and you also you got know, to, nowadays the, people... the circumstance and the the view of gangsters and mobsters, right? So people were already um, they were already we're more scared, yeah, of that. scared, of, scared of that. So that was probably an easier <laughs> sell. That oh yeah, the like mobsters are running this. You so know, like, <laughs> if you think about it, probably about eighty percent of the nation could care less about gangster crime because they all lived out in the countryside. Yeah. Sure, and in other towns that weren't bad, but still, yeah, I agree that it was probably a time that they can they just used fear to pass that type of. Well, that happens. Wow, it's like they're not doing that. Now. Happens every day. <laughs> never, never. Take back. Don't, don't miss the. Uh, what is that? Don't. The crisis. Take advantage of every crisis. Yeah. Don't let so, a good uh, crisis just, go uh, away. For a, there we go. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, though, in 1934, $200. Uh, in 2019, that's $3,700. No. Almost $3,800. Yeah. So can you imagine paying $3,800 for an SBR or just to have a silencer? No, that's just the tax. <laughs> that's not the, <laughs> that's not the, the right, product exactly. itself. Yeah. Well, and so in... So speaking of Chicago and Illinois, we talked about this in our current events segment a couple episodes ago, but um, they are on their way to ruling the firearm owner's identification card unconstitutional in Illinois because they're only one of four states that actually has an ID card that you need. And that was the argument was that you can't tax a right and you can't, you know, force somebody to pay money to exercise their rights. Yeah. Well, so, don't worry. That that judge will probably pull what they pulled in uh you know, California. Oh, I stay on my own command. You know, I, I apparently must have just been drinking too much when I said it was legal to <laughs> suddenly have constitutionally allowed standard capacity magazines. So I want to put a stay on my own order. I, I wouldn't, I actually won't be surprised if that happens at, um, in Illinois. In, in Illinois. It may, it may, because it's, I mean, the politics there are just as wonky as anywhere else, well, including I, California. So there was a video that just was out there a few days ago. I watched and it was in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And it was a security guard. Oh, in front of McDonald's. Of McDonald's. Yeah. Oh yeah, An yeah. Armed security guard at a McDonald's. Yeah, welcome to and, Chicago. And some individuals, I'll just be polite about all this. Decided they were going <laughs> to attack that individual security guard, and were just beating the ever living crap out of him. And he nobody was him. doing anything. And no one made any noise. And no one protested that fact. Mm-hmm. until he threw them off him and drew his gun. And then suddenly everybody in that entire building was panicking. Oh my God, that guy's going to shoot those guys. They're like, wait, one second ago, they're bashing his brains against the, the side of the building, trying to probably, I mean, I don't care. that that that's, that's trying to harm them to the point of maiming or killing them. Yeah, he was afraid for his life. And he pulls a gun and then all of a sudden, everybody in the restaurant suddenly cared. But it wasn't for the security guard. You noticed that there's, mm-hmm. they weren't scared for the security guard. They were scared for the guys that were beating him up. And then they, why they won't practically ran away. Oh, well, they <laughs> bailed like immediately. Cause yeah. I mean, that, that ended the fight. He didn't have to shoot anybody, which is awesome. I don't want anybody to have to have to shoot somebody to save their own, you know, right. unless they absolutely have to, if just presenting the firearm was enough to end the whole conflict right there. Excellent. You know, we don't and have that's to, a defensive yeah, gun use. Yeah, yes, it's, it it's a perfectly good defensive use. You know, like, uh, but it, it was just that that mentality of no one cared until the bad guys were about to get shot. It's, it's weird, man. It's that's sketchy, man. Well, I, and I can imagine living there. City city living is is different than rural living, and I don't think people have an appreciation for one or the oh, other. Right. And 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 Chicago, I mean, I mean, you know, you've you've lived in both, um, you know, and and Chicago's its own animal. Unfortunately, there's a lot of um, you know gang related violence, and and we had cartel related violence in Arizona. Yeah, I mean, all the time. I yeah. mean, there was the joke back in like when the when the real big, I think it was like what when El Chapo really took over. Back in 2007, 2008, like they were finding truckloads of heads in just downtown Phoenix and shit like that. Jesus, and they're like that's crazy, you know. And the joke was, how many heads could you fit in your Lobos? <laughs> you know, like, like, was oh, just like, yeah, whatever, you know. But you know, maybe cartel violence was pretty bad down there. I mean, and is that's not more violent than gangs in, in most cases? But yeah, they, uh, you know, that's that's city living. But I mean, we all were armed, and you'd be aware of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Situational awareness and carrying concealed. Yeah. Or so openly in that state. Doesn't or, matter. And you can do it here too. And you can do it here Thank too. goodness. So, well, I think we'll close on that. Um, Steve, what'd you say? I said, thanks goodness that we can carry here. Yeah, that's true. So, well, th- Cody, thank you very, very much yeah. for uh, spending some time here with us. Um, love to me. have you on again. I think we need to do an AK episode with Cody. That'd be great. Yeah, I'd be down for that. Um, if you have any questions about guns that aren't 
completely stupid. Uh, ask Cody, but maybe ask us first. Email us podcast at iishooting.com or uh, hit us up on Facebook and Instagram, facebook.com slash range minded podcast. You can find us range minded podcast on Instagram as well. And uh, we can put you in touch with Cody as well. So again, thanks, man. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll definitely see you again. In another yes, episode. Will. So sounds good. Take it easy. Thank you guys. For- right, Take care. You. Thanks for listening to Range Minded. Find us online at Range Minded Podcast on Facebook or send us an email at podcast at iishooting.com. We're always happy to get feedback, episode suggestions, whatever you want to send us, really. And be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and pretty much wherever else you get your podcasts from. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.